I'd like to cover, I'd, I'd like this all covered in clay and then sledge down. <laughs> on the playground. Playground. I'd like to live in that chill house. We're constantly made aware of the need to change our habits to respond to climate change. If everyone in the world consumed as much as the average European, we would need three planets to sustain our current way of life. We need to find ways to reduce our personal and collective impact. And we've already begun. We now recycle three times more waste for collection than we did ten years ago. People are starting to think more responsibly about flights and how far their food has travelled. We're more conscious about the car we drive and are starting to see renewable technologies in our homes and buildings. But while these are all positive changes, they are not enough. The built environment accounts for over 45% of all carbon emissions worldwide. So if we're to tackle global warming head on, we have to completely rethink not just the way we live, travel and consume, but the way we design, build and power our homes neighbourhoods and cities. An incredible number of new developments are being proposed across the world to house our growing population. Many so-called green cities or eco-towns are now only on the drawing board, so it's the perfect time to look for inspiration. The Swedes are renowned for their design, technical know-how and a socially holistic approach to living. It may be no surprise that they're also at the forefront of environmentally balanced city-scale development and have already built a green town. From the early 1990s, ideas were being put forward for a cutting-edge urban extension southeast of Stockholm city centre. The result is Hammarbyshjörstad, or Town by the Lake, an extraordinary example of an environmentally balanced new town extension. When complete, it will provide 11,000 homes for 25,000 people, over half of which are already built. Hammerby has all the facilities of a functioning town, including offices, a vast array of shops and restaurants, schools and daycare centres, a public library, a sports centre and ski slope, a church, great public transport with a regular tram and bus service, as well as car clubs, and beautifully designed public spaces along green avenues and waterside walks. But it didn't always look like this. Yes, about 100 years ago, this area was more like a leisure park, and people come out here for the weekends from the inner city. And it was a nice area, but after the years, it was more and more industrialized with very low type of industry with stores, workshops and it was a lot of such things in the area. I have always lived in Stockholm and this area was a bit scary uh, in, in my younger days. When the vision came up to remake this into a housing uh, area, uh, people thought that the town planners were stupid. Uh, of course when you start a great area, big area like this, the city has to take quite much risk in the beginning with the investments in the land and mainly in the infrastructure which we have to build up. The opinion was that this ground was unbuildable. Uh, it had used to be the bottom of a lake and it's low quality soil in the area. It was very contaminated because the small uh, industries just throw away everything. Uh, Hammarby Sjöstad was uh, originally an idea uh, where we wanted to have the Olympic Games in Stockholm in 2004 uh, and we, we decided that we would like to have an environmental profile on, on the, uh, the Olympic Village but we, did, we didn't succeed in getting the uh, Olympic Games but, but we did decided that we should continue with the, the uh, city. As a whole the Olympic Games or the bid created a willingness 
to take decisions and to put the environmental performance bar very high. And we also set up, uh, set up a very, very clear goal that we wanted to, to have the footprint for, for the, the household and, and the area compared to other households and areas. For Hammarby Sjöstad we have had like six different environmental goals. It's about better land use, it's about transportation and, and traffic, it's about polluted soil, it's about energy use, waste collection, water and sewage treatment, and also better buildings with good materials. So a broad goal was set to halve the carbon footprint of Hammarby compared to Swedish housing schemes in the early 90s. Stockholm City Planning took control of the land, placed a planning office on site, and devoted a considerable planning workforce to guide each step of the process. Uh, the organization within Stockholm working with Hammarby Sjöstad is, from the town planning part, it, it's two or three persons. And then we are some project leaders, some project managers on the development office. And uh, all together you can say that this planning part is around ten people. And then we have the, uh, the part of the project is, that's running the public works, design, leading of the design, and uh, the actual construction. And they are around 10 to 20 people from time to time. M most of the credits for the job with Hammarby Sjöstad that's had to be given to the city planning administration and the, and the development administration uh, of Stockholm. If there is one person that should be mentioned more than others, I, I would say John Inge Hagström. He was a planning architect working for the city who started with the project in, in the early 90s. Uh, tragically, he died two and a half years ago, suddenly. But he has been the most important single person for the project and he has been the visionary for the urban design of Hammarby Sjöstad. So with vision, passionate leadership and planning resource, Project Hamby Shostad had a great chance of success. But it could so easily have failed without an incredibly detailed and well-resourced master planning and delivery process. From the beginning we had this general plan which was outlined around 1995 or so, mainly by John Inge. And uh, then we divided the area in some bigger areas, it's maybe divided in ten different main areas and we, when we start up such an area we normally invite three architects, architect offices and they do, we can call it parallel sketches on how we should develop this area. When we designed the, the different blocks or, or uh, apartment buildings in Hama we have this process that the architects are working together uh, and uh, they are looking to each other sketching through the process and they are inspiring each other. We started a collaboration between the housing association, their top director and the private architect and the town planners. And it was very much like an academy. So we also had, we worked together. We, if there were many architects and many plots, they, we also showed each other what we're doing. And sometimes there was a little break that they build, they invited a critic who didn't like what we were doing at Hammarby Sjöstad or they invited some expert on crime. The police was here and talked to us, uh, how could you avoid uh, this, the crime in the housing? Uh, we also did study trips together. We went to uh, different places, Amsterdam and uh, London Docklands and different places to study what we were doing there and try to do better, <laughs> which we succeeded in many ways, I think. <laughs> The result of the, of the planning process is both two, two things actually, the, the, the sort of the legal part which is a map which says exactly what you can build and where you can't build and how high it can be and how many square meters etc etc. That's one part of it. Another part of it is this which is sort of a quality program for, for architecture or design within that that uh, pro overall project. And here you can find all the facades and pictures and, and how the projects are supposed to look with entrances and windows and sort of overall character. And that is uh, a way for the city authorities in this case to sort of ensure that the projects will be carried out in the next phase as it was supposed to be carried out in the planning phase. 
So when, when the legal phase is over and this is taken by the city authorities and all the democratic process has been gone through, maybe six months later, then you can have a building permit and then you start the real sort of, you make all the drawings to build by. It's a very tight and very integrated dialogue between various parties how to make sure that your plot of land becomes connected to the other one. So we manage the general areas in the, in the area with all parks, streets, uh, bridges, uh, light and so on, art and so on. And um, uh, so we put the, the design level in some way in the area which is quite important and we have also put a quite high level which we think has been profitable in the long run. And uh, then the developers, they do all work on their own block. They have the total econo economical responsibility for their own block. So uh, sort of concrete, cast concrete around the elevator shafts and the staircases. And then we have some bearing walls in concrete, usually between the, the apartments. And then the, uh, the uh, outer walls are light sort of frame, framework with uh, just insulation and uh, plaster mm -hmm. and, and windows. Mm -hmm. S usually wooden frames actually within those. It looks like stone buildings, but if you knock on them, they <laughs> sound hollow. It's a detailed process, but it, it's uh, um, working very much with consensus. It's sort of interactive process between the uh, different uh, groups involved with the process. And, uh, uh, hopefully it ends up with a good uh, physical result in the end. Investment by the city on the overall design was followed by developers funding a secondary, detailed but collaborative design process. As a result, the master plan, consisting of 12 sub-districts and over 70 project phases with several blocks in each, are all joined by an underlying design ethos. So there is consistency in scale and design of the new buildings, but with a variety in the architecture. Clarity of the delivery process has also enabled Hammerby to grow into a fully functioning town very fast. This has given the project positive momentum and confidence to the developers. The building started in 97 and it went on for let's say three years until the first people could move into the area and then there has been uh, six to seven hundred new apartments every year since then and we are still building until 2015 or 16. I, w I would say that uh, the way Stockholm has chosen first to make a program for the total uh, uh, site development and if you are participating in that program and there is a exchange of information and exchanging of, of uh, demands I have found actually that it, it costs a little bit extra but on the other hand when you come to the phase when you are starting to design the buildings because you have already started the design of the building. It goes very quick and the uh, building permission goes very quick because people have been involved. Uh, Hammerby is a good example of not just focusing on the short-term aspects and get the short-term profits but also investing for future and get that kind of uh, revenue back over time. It costs us roughly 5% more to build Hammerby from a purely construction cost perspective. But in the end, you get roughly 25% more property value out of the site over time, which is uh, pretty telling and says something about how real value is created over time. You have a stronger position if you own the land. You could, you're more responsible for the planning. And because the city uh, could sell land, they also got quite a lot of money. And money they used for infrastructure. They bought uh, the tram, which is very important. They, bought, they, have, they have money for a, a ferry over the canal. They have money so they could build schools and preschools. And, uh, and it's also a very nice high standard of the uh, landscaping and the pavements and a very good detailed work. We can say that the total expenditure in the, in the city part is around 500 million euros. But uh, the total volume of the whole project with the developers cost is about 3,000 million euros for the whole area. So of course they take in the end the greatest risks. But still we think this will be profitable for the city. In the long run we get more taxpayers and the city is growing and so. 
So extra resource and long-term thinking by the city planners means that Hammerbichostad promises to be a great place to live for decades to come. And designing a variety of homes that people want to live in for a long time is an essential part of creating a stable community. What we mean with family friendly is have maybe a little bit more generous apartments, have a good uh, outdoor space connected to the apartments, have good storage in, in the apartments, and also organize the apartments around staircases uh, and uh, the buildings organized around courtyards and the blocks organized uh, and connected between parks and have also traffic safe uh, approach to the area. Uh, from the beginning we thought that it was people uh, in my age maybe or a little bit older with the grown-up kids. Uh, when we started they called this area uh, uh, like Dinky Town and Dinky stands for double incomes no kids. But actually uh, if you have seen today there's a lot of uh, 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 families with small kids here. So they wanted me to come up with, uh, with ideas that the people would stay longer. Then I came up with the idea that we should have private small gardens or allotments in the courtyard. So pe and to support allotments we also have a very nice greenhouse. And in that respect people really live, uh, they sort of live there and they grow their own vegetables and plants and flowers and that makes them want to stay a lot longer and want to see what they've done and it's not not just one season maybe for many years but what about the most important people in the project what do the residents think well uh, the reason for me wanting to live here was that uh, they were building quite a lot of apartments. So I knew that there were some um, opportunities for me to get an apartment quite easily and quite quickly. I'm Katarina Hellström. Uh, I've been living here for the last one and a half years, together with my family. I mean, people actually really use their balconies and they, you know, both... It's, it's such early spring now, but... They are very, people have like small gardens in, on the balconies. It's actually, it's very beautiful in the summertime. It has like a balcony, like a winter garden. So you can use it both during winter time and also during summertime. And it's very nice to, if you want to have plants there or herbs or things like that. I like, I like the landscape of this garden as well. I mean, it's, and also the architecture. I think it's very nice. So my name is Karen Iverson. I've lived here for almost four years now. My name is uh, Yngve, Yngve Nilsson, and I moved here a couple of months ago. I really like how they have uh, used the space and, and the water, and so it's in some kind of harmony. I think it's very nice. It's water around everywhere, and uh, lots of restaurants, and uh, yeah, it's a nice place. And then the area is very nice to live in as well. You have water nearby, you can easily cycle to the city centre in 10 minutes. Uh, My name is Håkan Mortonsson. I've been living here in Hammarby for six years. The, the kids love it and it's a close way to school and like I said, the nature is around the corner. What I actually really like about this apartment is that it's so open. So we're now in the living room area. Uh, just here to the balcony where his tuva. Hey, he's good. It's it's a place where you walk a lot. You don't uh, you don't have to take it. We don't have a car. We're part of the carpool here. This is where we eat, and <clears throat> and it's open to the direct to the to the kitchen. So we when you cook, she, our daughter can play around here, sit out. I don't know, play or watch TV in the, in the living room and we have contact all the time. I would say that it, it is that they built, built the, um, the, the houses quite close to each other. So I, I do see my neighbours quite easily and can, can see into their apartments. So that's, I mean, I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm used to it now, but um, in the beginning it was a bit odd. So. Someone has thought about everything. Everything is planned. Everything yeah. is planned, exactly. Yeah. And it's, that's, in a way, very good and very nice. And in our daily life with Tuva, it's excellent. 
You walk a lot or you take the, the tram or, or the bus, so you meet people and, and you meet the, uh, the other parents to the kids. Almost every house uh, close to a bigger street, there's shops in the ground, ground floor, or cafes and uh, mm. quite, quite a lot of cafes uh, close here. And then and it's simple to get to the park, it's uh, always close to a park, or yeah. so you don't have to dress up and everything, you can just go and if something, some accident in the diaper, you can just <laughs> <laughs> go up, you don't have to <laughs> plan so much, that's very nice. <laughs> A final element to the Hammerby story is also the least visible. Neatly sewn into the master plan is a unique environmental approach to waste, energy and water that is renowned worldwide. It's called the Hammerby model. Each apartment block provides areas for people to dispose of hazardous waste like glass, plastics and bulky items which are taken away to be sorted. But many blocks in central Hammerby also provide waste inlets which are linked to an underground waste disposal system. Three separate inlets are provided. One for general waste, one for paper and one for organic waste. Once inserted, the different waste types are sucked at 70 kilometers an hour to a central sorting station which could be up to two kilometers away. Here the waste is automatically sorted into large containers before being taken away for further use. One of the main ideas behind Hammabi was to try to limit the heavy traffic. Uh, the waste traffic now is uh, confined to the main ro routes in the area uh, and there is no need to have waste trucks uh, pulling up to each building. Uh, if you don't have waste, heavy waste trucks in, in the small, more intimate streets, then of course you eliminate the risk of accidents. We monitor the quality of the organic waste being put into the system. And we can see it improving, but it's, you need to keep people informed uh, permanently really about the benefits and, and the need for recycling. And then more and more it becomes a thing, way of life. Organic waste is taken and used to compost plants to create biofuels. And combustible waste is carted off to provide fuel for one of Stockholm's combined heat and power plants. Here, it's incinerated to provide district heating and power for the Stockholm grid. We've been building on the district heating grid in Stockholm since the 1950s. And today we are providing nearly 80% of the households and other buildings in Stockholm with district heating. We have mainly two production plants providing Hammarby with heat and power and that is Högdalen, where we take household waste and turn it back to Hammarby as heat and power. And we also have a plant in Hammarby uh, where we have district heating, uh, power production, and uh, we also have uh, district cooling. We try to use what we call free cooling. We take cold seawater and distribu distribute it out in the area. That is a very environmental friendly way to get cool. The sewage water treatment plant at Henrikstal was built in the late 1930s and it deals with wastewater from 850,000, or roughly half, of Stockholm's residents, including those at Hammerby. Built within a hill, along a network of tunnels deep underground, the plant cleans the wastewater using filtration and sedimentation tanks. During the filtration process, Digesting tanks separate organic material from the water in the form of sludge. This is treated to create two byproducts. The first is biosolids, which can be used to fertilize biofuels. And the second is biogas. In the digesters, uh, there's about 65% uh, methane, and that's the energy part of the gas and the rest is carbon dioxide, but uh, you can't use that gas in vehicles, so we have to refine it. So what we are doing is, and what we're standing in, is one uh, upgrading plant. Uh, we upgrade it to 97% and more. Ella Stockholm Water, who is the owner of this plant, is then selling it to, for example, Hammarby Sjöstad. The upgraded biogas is used to fuel cars and taxis, as well as Stockholm's fleet of almost 100 biogas buses. It also provides cooking gas for restaurants and over 1,000 apartments at Hammerby.
And uh, when it leaves the, the treatment plant uh, in, in the springtime, it's about uh, 15 degrees, the water. And that's a lot of uh, energy in that temperature. So in this case, uh, we have an energy company who's called Fortum, who is buying the energy in the water. The warm water is used by Fortum as part of the district heating process, forming a symbiotic link between the two organizations. At the end of the process, clean water is sent back into Hammerby Lake and the Baltic Sea. So the Hammerby model creates a closed system of processes for waste, energy and water to maximize environmental benefits. In addition, storm water is equalized and cleaned through a sustainable urban drainage system, which is designed in to form a beautiful addition to the street scene. Solar energy is also part of the model. Hammerby Sjöstad is a very important project, visionary project, uh, where we're trying to, to uh, minimize uh, the energy need and maximize the free energy. And uh, the sun is one free energy that we have. So some uh, of the buildings here have uh, photovoltaics. This is a very small part of the holistic uh, view of Hammarby Sjöstad. So it's very important also how we use the energy uh, to think about not heating and cooling on the same time. Because this is an environmentally friendly area, you think that everybody moving in here are environmentally friendly. Unfortunately, that is not the case. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, and that is also one of the purposes that you really can move in here and be environmentally friendly because so much is in the infrastructure and the building. But we, we here, we would like them to participate even more and that's why uh, we have the centre, so they can come in here and ask questions about sorting the waste. And they also get these special bags for the uh, food fraction, because they, we are taking that out also. Uh, they made a cornstarch and they can get them free from the centre. Actually, if, if you have this aim of trying to reduce the environmental impact by half, as the goal is here, I think you have to see that you have a sort of a centre or some information area or office uh, where people can inform themselves about this programme. But also you have to be, not only you can just only sit back and say, hope that people are going to get into you, you also have to be more offensive. You have to also give information out in the letter boxes as we have this, we give out a small leaflet, just uh, paper. Here we also have this welcome pack, which we give out with some, well, the low energy lamp, some other things and so on. But then also information about the area and about the environment program and how they can participate. Last year we had roughly about 12,500 visitors to our center and between five to six thousand out of these visitors are coming from Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, North America, Canada, all over the world are coming. In terms of sustainable development in the heart of a city, uh, it uh, does a great job and uh, there is enormous interest from across the UK. Uh, we try to support groups of uh, people from Britain coming in, looking at the technology that's been deployed there, looking at the planning systems, looking at the way that Hammerby has delivered success for Stockholm and for Sweden. And we try to help people to draw the lessons from that uh, and to apply those to an environment back in Britain. At Hammerby you have the momentum. You've got the build rate where they're essentially they're selling 500 to 1,000 homes a year. That gives you the people. You see the people when you go there. They're wandering around everywhere. In fact, lots of them are actually out and about. It makes the place feel very safe. And then, of course, you have all the services that actually supply those people with the things they want. So you can get a newspaper, you can get a pint of milk, you can buy just about anything you want. You can get a birthday card, you can get a small present, and you can go for lunch. And it's one of the only developments I've been to where I'd recommend someone went for lunch. You, know, you go out and see a new build development in the UK, you can't even get a sandwich. I think one of the things from Hammerby that we've learned is that land ownership's key and the local authority have decided to invest their land for the long term rather than extracting year-on-year -year receipts to fund other parts of the local authority's programme. 
And of course, after 10 years or so, that's starting to pay off for Stockholm and they're getting receipts back to enable them to do other things. And that kind of model of investing land for the long term and taking control over land supply and getting the return over the long term is something we think local authorities should be doing in this country. Uh, certainly new places should be based on land value capture. But it's a, it's a long-term process and it's not something that you can extract value from on year on year. And that's a big message, I think, from Hammerby, long-term strategic land investment. Well, I think if we're successful, then in 30 years' time, we won't be talking about eco-towns. We won't even be talking very much about sustainability. Because if we've got it right, we will have embedded those things into everything we do uh, as just another aspect of quality and great places that we're building and enjoying living in. Taking on the sustainability challenge actually gives us huge opportunities for creativity and for business development. And it's not nearly as difficult as we're making it out to be.